everyone. I'm Diana Davison, advocate for the falsely accused and wrongfully convicted. And it's time to talk about how social justice has infected our legal systems. So I've been watching a lot of interviews with James Lindsay, Peter Bogosian, and Helen Pluckrose lately. For those who don't know who this trio is, they managed to get multiple hoax papers published in peer-reviewed journals proving that what they call grievance studies are academically vacuous. You can find out more about their work on the website New Discourses, which I'll link below, or by buying a copy of a fabulous new book called Cynical Theories, written by Lindsay and Pluckrose. While listening to their podcast interviews, I was shocked at how much similarity there is between the rhetoric that they've encountered and the research that I've been doing over the last few years into sexual assault law and how it's been infected by the same ideology. And I'll tell you why. While the grievance studies managed to get a paper published saying how dog parks contribute to our understanding of rape culture, feminists have now changed the law sufficiently that men have been convicted and branded sex offenders for waking up their wives in the morning with sexual touching. This is something that as the laws were being uh, passed, as things were being interpreted, they said, well, this would never happen, right? It was deemed to be an outrageous conclusion, not worthy of consideration. And yet, slowly these things end up becoming um, you know, popular culture. And just like the effects of grievance studies have found their way into just about every institution without anyone noticing, the same thing has happened with law because they changed it through how the law is interpreted instead of through the regular lawmaking process. Now, the grievance studies look at a variety of subjects, including critical race theory, fat studies, disability studies, whereas for the last seven years, I've been solely researching how women's and gender studies have infected law schools. And by infected, I mean this. In Canada, there is a group called the Women's Court of Canada, this is obviously a group of feminists, but more importantly, it is primarily feminist law professors at universities, and they're a little bit like a cult. Look at this. In the opening paragraph here, you can see that their very first event was hosted by a journalist, Heather Malik, who writes for the Toronto Star. This ongoing link to journalists is incredibly important, and it's what has propelled their ideology into the mainstream culture. So this group of women celebrated Section 15, the equality section of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, by singing it in an opera and doing interpretive dance. At the end of this description, you'll see that some slam poetry was read over the chanting of women reading out court decisions. So let me explain that a bit. The Women's Court of Canada takes Supreme Court decisions that they don't like and they rewrite them through a feminist lens. And then they teach their version of that decision to their law students instead of teaching them what the law in Canada actually is. They train them to be activists and teach them what they think the law ought to be. Court members say writing judgments has helped them to better understand equality as well as to see the law from a judge's perspective. For the women involved who have a connection to academia, which is most of them, the judgments have become a teaching tool and also a form of academic writing that posits concrete solutions instead of just being critical. But never worry, we are told. This is just an academic exercise dressed up as judgment, says Kazari Govinder, legal director of the West Coast Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, also known as LEAF. I've talked a lot about LEAF in other videos. That group intervenes in real court cases in the appellate courts using the critical theory developed by this network of academics and has been the most successful intervener in Canada's Supreme Court. Just as is said at the end of this paragraph, this group is embodying critical thinking and are fully aware that this way of knowing is fuzzy at best. While these shadow judgments have no legal standing, they've been almost universally well received as an exercise that embodies democratic and critical thinking and moves forward the fuzzy notion of true equality. So this is where the grievance studies are so wonderfully helpful. 
From this article posted on the New Discourses website, please note that the first paragraph, about $10 billion a year, are going into these industries. These feminist academics and activists are heavily linked into that funding through all the different women's ministries and grant programs. When, through LEAF, the litigators intervenors, in court, they additionally get access to government funding called the Court Challenges Program. The first thing they mention in the article is discourse manipulation. The list of terms that the DIE, that's diversity, inclusion, and equity industry, has manipulated into a specialist meaning that is quite different than the meanings it knows people will assume of them is now quite substantial and familiar. They give the example, racism means systemic racism, which doesn't even require a single racist person or intention. Now, in legal activism, you have to understand, whenever they use the word equality, they're talking about a thing called substantive equality, not formal equality. And substantive equality is 100% equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. This is normally referred to by the grievance studies as equity. Feminist legal theory talks about systemic injustice against women and girls, which also does not require any evidence of a specific individual being misogynistic, nor of any intention to be misogynistic. It is entirely their point that sexism, in the form of stereotypes and myths about women, disguise themselves as common sense in legal decisions. Common sense is now practically forbidden in sexual assault trials. If you don't believe me, here is a 2017 Alberta Court of Appeal decision, RV ARJD, in which an acquittal was overturned and sent back to retrial. Note the scare quotes around common sense and logic. They go on to say, an example of how deeply ingrained and seductive these myths and stereotypes can be. In this judicial analysis, the trial judge carefully and correctly cautioned himself against reliance on certain myths and then proceeded to rely on another, one he obviously did not recognize and cloaked as it was with the faux imprimatur of common sense. Now I want to point out that this is sometimes true, but if the guy is convicted with evidence of stereotypes at play in the trial, the prosecutors always, always argue that stereotypes about men don't result in prejudice simply because a conviction resulted. And convictions are presumed to be the correct outcome of every sexual assault trial. This precise argument is going before the Supreme Court in November of 2020 in a case called R.V. Langan. The New Discourses article goes on to say, the political agenda they've identified comes from a long-standing line of radical thought called critical theory, and how that has become critical social justice. And they explain why critical theory is a very bad thing. I note that some of the law professors I've come across have also called themselves professors of social justice. Most certainly, there is a political agenda to feminist legal theory. Now, look at this 1986 paper by Alan Hunt called The Theory of Critical Legal Studies. That's how long this has been going on since the 1980s. Hunt proudly announces that this United States-based movement is progressive because it comes from a committed left political stance and perspective. A convenient summary is provided by Cornell Law School. Critical Legal Studies, CLS, is a theory which states that the law is necessarily intertwined with social issues, particularly stating that the law has inherent social biases, Proponents of CLS believe that the law supports the interests of those who create the law. As such, CLS states that the law supports a power dynamic which favors the historically privileged and disadvantages the historically underprivileged. CLS finds that the wealthy and the powerful use the law as an instrument for oppression in order to maintain their place in hierarchy. Many of the CLS movement want to overturn the hierarchical structures of modern society, and they focus on the law as a tool in achieving this goal. A hallmark of the grievance studies is that anyone who disagrees with their theory is showing their privilege, 
and their desire to maintain the hierarchy from which they must somehow benefit. It uses the language of oppression to appeal to the masses who reasonably feel that the courts are inaccessible to them in order to overturn the system in the name of equality. On that same page from Cornell, they list the subgroups of critical legal studies. CLS includes several subgroups with fundamentally different, even contradictory, views. Feminist legal theory examines the role of gender in the law. Critical race theory, CRT, examines the role of race in the law. Postmodernism is a critique of the law influenced by developments in literary theory, and it emphasizes political economy and the economic context of legal decisions and issues. Not to end there, these groups have combined themselves. Postmodern feminist legal theory is often heard asking why it hasn't really caught on as fast as other critical theories. They have a manifesto in everything. Why are they having to fight so hard in court? Well, the reason is this. The courts try to discover facts in a case. Postmodernism takes the position that facts are subjective, and reality can't actually be known. Wikipedia keeps it short and sweet. Postmodern feminist legal theorists reject the liberal equality idea that women are like men, as well as the difference theory that women are inherently different from men. This is because they do not believe in singular truths, and instead see truths as multiple and based on experience and perspective. Feminists from the postmodern camp use a method known as deconstruction, in which they look at laws to find hidden biases within them. Someone, by the way, ought to go tell Wikipedia they have a spelling error, but I couldn't be arsed, and they'll probably just say that the dictionary is patriarchal and there are many ways of knowing spelling. Postmodern feminists use deconstruction to demonstrate that laws should not be unchangeable since they are created by people with biases and may therefore contribute to female oppression. Now, we can laugh about this, or we can realize that innocent men are going to jail right now because postmodern feminist critical legal theorists have successfully intervened in just enough cases to change the definition of consent. Consent is strictly in the subjective mind of the complainant. So if she said that she didn't consent, then that is the only evidence that the court can receive. Since she's also not required to show she doesn't consent, meaning she doesn't have to actually say no, she doesn't have to do anything to try and reject the person in order to establish non-consent, since she's not required to show that she doesn't consent, the man can't argue honest but mistaken belief in consent. As such, the burden of proof is on the accused to prove that she is lying when she says she did not consent subjectively. Quite clearly, sexual assault is now a reverse onus offense, and anyone who pretends differently is fooling themselves and or the public. Only a few judges have stood their ground and said that they are still permitted to assess the credibility of a complainant's claim of non-consent. And it gets worse. Any evidence the judge weighs that makes him doubt the credibility of the complainant is now being called a rape myth. So the burden of proof is on the accused, and most of their evidence is blocked in court under the expanded rape shield laws. Any person accused of sexual assault who doesn't testify is almost guaranteed to be convicted because the complainant's testimony will be deemed unchallenged once all the supposed rape myths are disposed of. One of these alleged myths is that women lie about rape. So why are feminists still saying, given all of these factors going into trial for anybody accused of sexual assault, why are feminists still saying that women shouldn't trust the legal system and pushing for more constraints on the accused in the trial process? Like all grievance studies, they can never be satisfied because their entire existence is based on claiming oppression. So they must always insist that there is a systemic bias until they've completely deconstructed the entire legal system. But in law, these groups, these, these ideological, you know, 
grievance groups and critical thinking groups are much better at hiding their insanity. That said, crazy can't always hide. I'll leave you with Allard School of Law's professor, Janine Benedet, explaining why men should not even be allowed to argue that they had consent when they're accused of sexual assault. Uh, we need to take a step back and recognize that, that claims of consent in sexual assault cases, which are seen as just a routine part of a sexual assault trial, are, are actually themselves uh, really quite exceptional claims. When an accused argues that the complainant consented, he is saying that the complainant had consensual sexual activity and then turned around and cried rape to the police and everyone else and is now lying under oath in court. That's what it means to argue consent. And we treat this claim as routine, but in fact, it calls very deeply on a sexist rape myth um, that false complaints are commonplace and put men at risk of wrongful conviction, despite the fact that the evidence does not bear that out at all. And we created a whole system of legal rules um, and definitions that were based on that myth. We might have dismantled them formally, but the attitudes remain. And so what I would like is for the, com the claim of consent to be viewed as exceptional. Yes, it's open to the accused to argue that in this particular case, the myth is in fact reality, and this woman did bring a false complaint of sexual assault and is lying under oath. But that claim needs to be viewed by the criminal justice system with skepticism, right, as something that doesn't happen all the time um, uh, and deserves to be treated as such.